as as, as part of this on my screen. Does that mean anything? No, I'm I'm just on with Jan. I'm just okay. sitting here. Okay, you guys are together. All right. Go for it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending your lunch hour to listen and to gain valuable information on dementia. This is the first of a series of three webinars that will discuss non-pharmacological and appropriate pharmacological approaches when supporting a person with dementia. The next webinar will be on October 4, 2016, where Dr. Elizabeth Ekstrom will discuss when antipsychotic medications are not appropriate then on October 19, Dr. Maureen Nash will present on when antipsychotic medications are appropriate. If you haven't registered for these webinars, we hope you will do so immediately following this one. These webinars are being recorded and will be available within a week after the presentation. These webinars are brought to you by the Oregon Partnership to Improve Dementia Care. The partnership consists of representatives of the Oregon Healthcare Association, Leading Age Oregon, Oregon Department of Human Services, Health Inside Oregon, Providence Elder Place, the Alzheimer's Association, and MOVE. We are also fortunate to have Terry Fagan with Consonus Pharmacy and Cy Simonson, consultant pharmacist, on our team as well. In the past few years, there has been a great deal of emphasis in long-term care settings to decrease the use of antipsychotic medications for people with a diagnosis of dementia. These are powerful drugs that have dangerous side effects and for the most part do not improve the well-being of the person living with dementia. The goal of these webinars is to emphasize the importance of appropriate assessment and how adopting a person-centered approach to care can enhance their lives. Today, I am happy to introduce to you Liz von Welsheim. Liz is a nurse practitioner and CEO, medical director of Elder Health and Living, Memory Care Community in Springfield, Oregon. She has an extensive background in the field of geriatrics and has provided effective education to many professionals on the topic of dementia. Liz's presentation, Tools for Managing Behaviors in Persons with Dementia, or Neurocognitive Disorders, will focus on assessment and person-centered approaches in lieu of medications that can enhance a person's life. After Liz's presentation, there will be a short question and answer period. After the webinar, you will receive an email with an evaluation asking you to give us some feedback on today's presentation. Thank you, Liz. Uh, you may now begin. Hi, this is Liz von Wildheim. Thank you for joining us on this um, lunch hour. Today I'm going to talk about tools for managing challenging behaviors in persons with dementia, which we now like to use the term neurocognitive disorders. Before I do that, I will um, just do a quick disclaimer. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not represented by any pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I am one of the owners of Elder Health and Living, which is a memory care community in Springfield, Oregon. You will notice that some of the pictures I've taken, I have permission from families and residents to um, use them um, from our facility. So what is a neurocognitive disorder? It's, it's, you have to have a significant decline in two or more neurocognitive domains, and we'll talk about those in a second. And you also have some functional decline that goes along with that. So the, the declines we're talking about are attention. So you have to be able to attend to different tasks, like uh, balancing your checkbook or uh, writing a letter, uh, being able to operate a telephone, things like that, to not have a deficit. Language skills are another neurocognitive domain so that you're able to um, find words easily, create full sentences and understand as well, comprehend what people are saying to you. Your executive function is the part of your brain that allows you to get up and go, so to speak. This is the part of the brain that's, that tells you, in the morning, I have to be at work by 9 a.m., and it backs you up so that you know what time to set your alarm for, how much time you need to shower and eat breakfast, and what the traffic's going to be, and it allows you to do all that sequencing so that you are at work on time. Learning and memory are also parts of the neurocognitive domain, and that's the ability to learn new information, um, directions, and 
uh, computer programs, email, and to retain it uh, over time. Social cognition is the part of the brain that is able to be culturally and socially appropriate so that you know when you are in a uh, work situation that you don't uh, use swear words or you know that when you are uh, out at the opera, you know, you, you don't suddenly start talking to somebody sitting next to you. You have social awareness of what's appropriate. Perceptual motor is really the ability to uh, do things, you think of like coordination, be able to set an alarm clock, uh, be able to text, be able to uh, drive manually, um, and uh, basically be able to write and things like that. All of these uh, neurocognitive domains are important to our ability to manage ourselves through our life. And when there's a deficit in two or more of these, we uh, have a diagnosis of a neurocognitive disorder. What we're going to talk about are some tools that you can use to manage the behavioral issues associated with these deficits, people with neurocognitive disorders. The first tool is I really like people to understand what type of dementia or neurocognitive disorder you're working with. I find that Frequently, I'll uh, open a medical chart and it'll just say, patient has dementia. Well, that, that tells me there's a global problem. They're unable to um, manage their life without some assistance, but it doesn't really tell me what type of dementia they have and thus how I'm to treat them. And you'll see as we go through the typical types of dementia that there really is profound differences. And I think a lot of frustration that caregivers and families as well as healthcare practitioners have, is that we use one cookie cutter approach to all persons with dementia. And when we break it down, we usually get better results. Um, they also respond differently to uh, different medications, to different disease modifying agents. Um, you know, for instance, vascular dementia is going to be sensitive to statins and lowering lipids, um, Alzheimer medications like Aricep and, uh, or Dinipazil are going to respond better to Alzheimer's than, say, frontal lobe type dementia. And each one requires a different behavioral approach as well as a different medication approach. And each has a different prognosis. Some are quite fast. Alzheimer's is, you know, uh, an expectancy from diagnosis to death of 10 to 20 years versus progressive supranuclear palsy or something that's really a shorter diagnosis, five to 10 years, and some are even uh, shorter than that. So we'll go through the typical types of neurocognitive disorders, and the most popular, most common, probably 60% of all types of dementia is Alzheimer's type dementia. Alzheimer's type dementia, I'd like to think of them as energizer bunnies. People with Alzheimer's are busy. And they're busy because they're visually triggered. That means that they look in their environment, see things, and respond to what they're seeing. There isn't a big um, ability of their brain to sequence, to do that executive function thing, to uh, really concentrate or attend to information. They, they look, they see, they do. It reminds me frequently of a two-year-old, for instance, who's you know, up in their bed in the morning and uh, they don't say to themselves, hey, you know what, I think today I'm really, I'm going to get out of bed, I'm going to go downstairs, I'm going to go into the kitchen and go to that cabinet under the sink where that really cool Clorox is. I'm going to open the cap and kick back some Clorox. That's a lot of sequencing and attention to detail and all the rest of it. So why do two-year-olds drink Clorox? The reason they drink Clorox is because the cabinet under the sink is at eye level. They visually see a handle. They visually open the door to explore. They see the Clorox and the cool cap on it, and they open that, and then they're very tactile, so they're going to drink it. Nothing was intentional. Alzheimer's is, is similar to that in that if you, if you have a door, they'll open the door. If you have a path, they like to follow paths. They like to follow railings. They like to follow sidewalks. They um, you know, 
when we hear about people getting lost or wandering away, what they're actually doing is following the sidewalk. And then if they happen to stop at a bus stop and a bus pulls up and the door opens, again, visually triggered, they'll get on the bus and they'll go wherever it's going. I've had patients that have ended up in Seattle and San Francisco and all over the place because they got on I-5 by mistake and either went north or south and then just kept following it. Amazing they could like get enough gas to make it all that way. Um, it's when they run out of gas that they got into trouble. Sometimes they were able to see a sign for gas and solve a sign, visually triggered, you know, fill their tank and then just get right back on I-5. Memory prompting for Alzheimer's is not helpful. So saying to somebody with Alzheimer's, Mom, you remember, I just told you that this morning. There's an appointment this afternoon with your practitioner. Not helpful and makes them feel stupid, makes them feel ashamed and embarrassed. And if you can help your families and the care staff in any of the communities that you go to, really get off of that ride of prompting for Alzheimer's, it, it would be helpful for them to not then become frustrated and agitated and aggressive. It's when they believe they're doing something wrong and they're in trouble or you know, they feel stupid that they're generally going to act out. Best way to help them is to have some memory prompting devices such as um, whiteboards that in the kitchen or a calendar in the kitchen and it basically is set out the day for them so that you're not constantly having to say we have an appointment at 2 o'clock this afternoon, it's with your dentist, um, your daughter Liz is going to come take you. You write that on the board and then you actually can train a person with Alzheimer's to go look, go check out the board, go look at the board, you say that enough times and are consistent about it, then they know to look at the board to find the information out. And it's it's for really basic things like what are we eating for lunch, what time are we eating, where are we going, you know, do we have any errands to run today. Put it all on the board to decrease frustration of the caregiver which then allows them to be more sensitive to the needs of the person with Alzheimer's. Medications are going to be uh, talked about by the next two presenters over the next uh, two webinars. Um, just letting you know there's specific medications that we use for Alzheimer's the denipazil and rapidine or uh, rapistigmine and memantine. And I'll let the next presenters talk about those. For behaviors uh, with Alzheimer's, sometimes antipsychotics, generally not all that effective. And again, I'll have you refer to webinar number two and number three to um, uh, have more in-depth discussion of that. So the non-pharmacological approaches to Alzheimer's just keeping in mind those things we talked about, uh, you want to try to engage them and move in new spaces, don't distress them, don't upset them, you know, have places they can walk and explore. One of the things that's um, challenging is a lot of care communities um, are upset because the person with Alzheimer's is going in other people's rooms. Oh my God, he just walks right into her room. Well. The care community really needs to rethink, uh, rethink that concept because of course they're going to walk into rooms. There's doors, there's handles, they're going to open them. We talk about their care community being a home and in everybody's home we're allowed to open all the doors that we want to. And to be told no, don't do that, usually makes them upset, again makes them um, feel stupid and thus uh, reactive and become physically aggressive at times. So you want doors to be open and places to explore. I kind of call it shopping. Um, there's some residents that absolutely do not want their room invaded. They're very territorial. They, get a, they put a lock on their door and they carry a key around their wrist and they lose it and we find it and we open the door for them. But it, if the door is locked then the person moves on to the next door. And if the door is open, they go in and you talk to families and you talk to staff about, you know, they're going to explore the drawers because that's really fun. They're going to explore the closet and they might put on a white sweater that belongs to Betty and then come out and then Betty may or may not know it's her white sweater and then you work on sharing 
and treating them like a family. But at the end of the day, things go back where they belong. But, but to try to keep them from doing this exploring, walking, and this curiosity that they have really increases their level of anxiety. If you try to put a person, remember, I'm calling them the energizer buddies, try to put them in a chair in front of the television and sit there and behave themselves and be, you know, uh, don't move, not going to happen. And so create environments where that isn't the expectation. I put baby dolls down here. You can see this gentleman uh, just loves this little baby. Uh, he loves children. And it, it's a comfort to him. At times he knows it's a baby doll, and at other times he thinks it's kind of real. And it, it allows him that tactile engagement and caring for and nurturing. The need to nurture is um, rather profound in most residents with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. They really want to care for something. And uh, the baby dolls are perfect. Generally women, but I do find a fair number of men that that like to have babies. The next thing that helps to keep folks from getting frustrated, or if they are frustrated, to put them in a better space is music. The part of the brain that recognizes music um, really isn't affected by Alzheimer's. That's why you hear all these wonderful stories about, oh my God, they put this music on and he just started singing and he knew every word, and I don't know if he really has Alzheimer's. Well, he really does. It's that that part of the brain is preserved. The, the great part about music is that it can improve somebody's um, sense of well-being and their emotional state really quickly. So all of us have music in our head that puts us in a good place. Usually it's the music in our teenage years, high school, early 20s, that when that song comes on the radio, we are brought back to driving in the car with our best friends, radio blaring, singing out loud, and that good sense of, oh, this is a great day. Well, every one of the residents has that in their brain. Every person with Alzheimer's has that music in their brain. And you, you try to find what their music is, what their playlist is. Um, it's, it can be challenging to find the real playlist, to find those feel-good songs. Generally, we talk to families about creating iPods specifically for the residents that is their kind of music. Is it country? Is it classical? Is it rock and roll? Whatever it is. And finding the decade or the generation, what was popular in that time, if they really don't know, is helpful. We've had um, high school kids that need to do their community project that we've asked them to set up iPods and playlists for their um, family member, which is helpful. One thing that's challenging about iPods with Alzheimer's is that they are really cool to play with. And there's lots of little knobs and the screen, and you can play with it. It kind of tastes good, apparently. So sometimes you actually have to hide the iPod when you put the uh, earbuds in. You put it on, on the back of their head so that the wires go to the back of their neck and then you um, secure with a clip or with a safety pin or something the iPod in a little holder. It's a little bit challenging. You can't put it in their front pocket. You can't put it on their arm like an exercise one because they play with it and take it apart and ruin it. Nine times out of 10, we can't find a way that, that they allow the earbuds to be in their ears for very long. So we end up just uh, taking their personal iPod and putting it on a stereo system in the home and, and having it be their day for the music or their morning or hour for their playlist and then switch them out. The next thing that's really helpful, again, these energizer bunnies, these moving um, persons with Alzheimer's, is exercise. You've got to wear them out. You can't, these are not the ones that are going to enjoy sitting and watching television. And it's, it's hard because the exercise that they like to do um, usually involves work if it's men, so they want to go um, split wood or stack wood or um, take the furnace apart or build something in the shop with power tools or, um, or work in the garden with power tools or um, maybe go for walks if they have the habit of walking, maybe stationary bikes, but usually their exercise is around yard work and things like that 
which is great if they're living at home and you want to encourage them to continue the non-power tool type exercises. I have one patient um, that's living at home who has replanted his lawn three times. He goes out and he digs it all up and the first time he put uh, sunflower seeds instead of the grass seeds down and all these sunflowers came up and his wife was, you know, luckily she has a good sense of humor and so then he went and got rid of all those and tried to plant grass that didn't come up or he forgot and tilled it all up again and actually hoed it all up by hand and then planted grass. So those kind of things that use large muscle uh, movement is, is helpful. Lastly, work. This is a generation still that believes that you should work and you should be doing something meaningful and I think um, care communities realize this and they take it to the level of, well, we have them fold laundry. It really needs to go beyond folding laundry. You need to have, uh, if it's women and it's housework, have them really do dishes. And the only way that, that this generation uh, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s really have deep memory for doing dishes is that you have a sink full of soapy water and, a, and another sink that you can rinse in. They don't like leaving the water running and trying to scrub off the plate and put it in the dishwasher. They want to put their hands in the soapy water. You can occupy them for a long time if you allow them to do that in, uh, at home. They like to wipe down tables, they like to sweep, they like to, some of them are really good at making beds, some of them are really good at dusting, and a little duster and they go around uh, the house. Um, they'll spend hours doing it and they'll do it over and over. And so I want people to stretch beyond the folding laundry when you're thinking of um, working. Okay. So the next type of uh, neurocognitive disorder we're going to talk about is a vascular type of dementia. And these folks are the polar opposite of Alzheimer's type dementia. Vascular dementia is really the couch potatoes, as I call them. These are the folks that have a hard time with get up and go. They just can't do it. So they uh, get accused of being depressed or lazy. They, um, families are, are irritated with them for not helping out more. Can't you see that I'm, I need help with the laundry or the dishes or I need help carrying the groceries in and nope, they just sit there, usually watch TV. Their favorite word is no. And what's interesting about them is that Prompting does help. Memory prompts are helpful. Remember, in Alzheimer's, not helpful at all. In vascular dementia, the whole job of the caregiver is that they prompt persons with vascular dementia to remember a memory or to remember to get up and go to the bathroom. You become a little cheerleader. And if it's the spouse that's the cheerleader, very challenging for the spouse because usually the person with vascular dementia doesn't like someone telling them what to do and they get very annoyed, but you have to make it very exciting and, hey, let's go, come on, let's get up and go. We got things to do and clap your hands and put music on and get them to move from sitting on the couch to getting up and going for a walk or going to the bathroom. You can say to persons with vascular dementia, hey, remember your daughter was here yesterday? First word, no. And you can say, oh, yeah, she came in, she brought cookies, click, click. They will grab the memory and, and, re and finish the story for you. Oh, yes, and she brought my grandbaby, and she had that lovely red sweater on, and we had such a good time, and we went out for a walk, and they'll be absolutely right. These are the folks that usually go undiagnosed for a long time. These are the ones that go to practitioners' offices and look really good because they'll be asked a question, which is the trigger, the cheerleader, so to speak, that will help prompt the memory enough. They'll have a normal conversation. They have great verbal skills. They don't lose words, like Alzheimer's has a hard time with word finding and eventually will lose their vocabulary. These folks don't, ever. Late in the disease, they'll have full sentences which is confusing, but they won't be able to care for themselves. They won't be able to attend and concentrate and do the executive function of getting from point A to point B. Uh, behavioral assistance, treating underlying depression does help 
again, I don't know for treating depression or for actually just sort of giving a brain stimulant to help with that initiation. So sometimes the SSRI medications work. Again, I'm going to uh, skim over medications. The disease-modifying agents, things that uh, help with vascular disease, just like when you think of heart disease or stroke prevention, all of those uh, type treatments. Uh, the non-pharmacological approaches are, again, that cheer cheerleader, and it's annoying, but it's the only thing that really helps get them up and get them going. They will literally sit and wet themselves and then be triggered to get up and go because they feel that they are wet. So if you can go and engage them and be happy and fun and uh, coerce them to stand up and go for a walk and then end up in the bathroom, that's great. Uh, remind them of things, work. Music it, uh, works with this population well. They will keep their iPod on. They will listen and um, sing with it and that can activate dancing. That can be the trigger to get them to remember about dancing and moving. You have to create joy and fun and the care partners have to do all the creating. It's um, unlike Alzheimer's where once you start the fun, they're good to go and they'll laugh and they'll have a good time. These folks you have to keep pushing to keep engaging them throughout the activity. Conversations are great. So if you go and visit somebody that has vascular dementia and you, you, know, you bring a poem or you bring a, a spiritual literature or something, you can have a little conversation about that and you can help them remember uh, events that happened historically in their life around that piece of literature. Next type of neurocognitive disorder that we're going to talk about is uh, Lewy body dementia. This uh, type of dementia is, kind of looks a lot like Parkinson's dementia. It reminds me of persons that are in the later stage of Parkinson's having problems with uh, mobility of their gait. Uh, usually their first complaint to their practitioner is that they're falling or their coordination is good, they're tripping, and their care partner will say, ah, and their memory isn't so, gay, so great. Frequently, they have some uh, REM sleep disorder, so uh, dreaming really intensely and responding to those dreams. They can be violent when they're sleeping. Care partners, uh, if they're still sleeping together, will typically uh, move out of the room at that time so they don't get injured. They have sleep patterns that might be sleeping for two to three days. Again, care partners, family members are very concerned, they end up taking them to the emergency room where they wake up and they're perfectly fine. They need to be educated about this sleep disorder because they really have their own pattern and you, you just need to reassure them that they are okay. And when they wake up, make sure you give them enough fluids and food and um, do as much as you can while they're awake and just know they might be awake for days and then be out for a couple days. Lewy body is interesting in that um, you, you have good days and bad days, so uh, fluctuation in their ability to attend and concentrate and really can fool you. If you see them on day one, they will score higher on their cognitive exams, on the MOCA or, or slums or mini mental or whatever. They'll score well and they'll be attending and their speech will be pretty good. And then you see them the next day and they're very impaired. And so they're uh, they're difficult to diagnose at times, and they also are difficult to create a, a standard care plan for it. The care plan has to really be flexible and think about how are they today versus tomorrow, and what, are we, what supports do they need to get through this day when they're pretty alert and with it versus when they're more impaired. Lewy body is more likely to have hallucinations and delusions that are scary. These are the ones where people are breaking into their house or that there's a person that lives in their house that the family can't see but comes out when the fam just when the family leaves or is uh, threatening them or stealing from them. The uh, type of hallucinations or delusions that somebody with, with Alzheimer's tends to get are, are really kind of fun. So those are the ones like little kittens on the back of the couch, uh, children in the corner that they talk to and visit with. When 
The hallucination is nice and fun. I usually uh, don't treat it till the family to treat them like the imaginary friends, like you do with kids. When they're scary, you need to do a lot about changing the environment to reduce their misperception of what's happening. So a lot of times they'll see a chair in the corner, the light isn't strong enough, and they'll misperceive it as a person or something threatening. So making sure lights are on, that shades are drawn at night so that the street lights don't become um, misperceived as something threatening coming into the house. Uh, sometimes the medications that we use for Alzheimer's, we use for Lewy body, and it reduces those hallucinations. Other times you need to go to stronger medications um, to help with those. Mostly the environmental things that we do, the non-pharmacological approaches are, like I said, keep the room well lit to reduce illusions or misperceptions of what's there. Keep a uh, person's active in the environment except for when they're sleeping, but keep things happening so that they don't sort of daydream and go into that half sleep, half wake, where they, uh, when they fully wake up, they're very confused and threatened and uh, feel scared and then are reactive to that fear. Engage these folks in normal conversation. You don't need to simplify it. Sometimes you need to slow down, but don't talk down to them. Um, treat them as though every day is one of their good days. Exercise is important, but it's challenging because, again, they're losing their ability to walk and to move early in the disease. They're losing this, so they're using walkers and um, merry walkers and wheelchairs a lot earlier than Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's folks, they are walking till the very end of their disease. They can walk. They have great mobility skills. These folks are falling early on. So the exercise to keep their strength and their mobility for as long as possible. Falling, when it does become an issue, uh, we like to use a lot of Mary Walkers. I don't know if you out there in the audience have seen a Mary Walker, um, but Mary Walkers are these PVC pipes, things that create a um, uh, support around a person that allows them to hold on to the bars and stand whenever they want to and push the merry walker that has wheels or a chair is built into it and they can sit. So they can sit, stand, sit, stand uh, frequently. The, the reason we like to use them is that they keep folks independent in their walking much longer versus folks that uh, have a, a standard walker and they get put in a chair by a caregiver and they want to get up two minutes later and then they need standby assist to walk put them back down for two minutes and then they want back up and down and up and down. The Mary Walker just lets them do that you know, a thousand times a day if that's what they want to do. Music um, via the iPod can be challenging. They misperceive what's happening. Music's better when it's either live music or um, on a stereo and more of a surround sound. Uh, and again, the same thing occurs. If they have songs that they liked when they were younger, they're going to most likely recognize those and have them be a source of pleasure and comfort. Substance abuse, uh, neurocognitive disorders, usually we think of things like alcohol, but as time goes by we're going to be thinking more about meth and um, other um, medications that uh, affect the brain cells and affect brain function. Uh, for now, we'll just talk about alcohol since it's still the most common. As everyone knows, alcohol kills brain cells every time you drink. And for a person to actually get uh, dementia associated with their alcoholism, they have to have been drinking quite a while. And usually these folks are found out in the community, found down on the streets, got in a bar fight, they end up in the ER, they have broken something or have wounds or sores, they get admitted to the hospital and what happens is they go, they begin to detox while they're in the hospital. This uh, detox process and the acute delirium associated with it can look like they have severe dementia, severe Al Alzheimer's or Lewy body and they're delusional and they're paranoid and they're physically aggressive and it's really the detoxing that's happening. It takes 
seniors a lot longer to really dry out than it does younger people. So what generally happens is they're not in the hospital long enough to finish their detox. They end up going to a nursing home or something and they continue to have behavior problems which then probably get medicated and we never really dry them out fully to see where they're at. Frequently after, well not frequently, but uh, it has occurred and from from my practice in the last 10 years owning elder health and living, I've discharged three patients who had alcohol induced dementia or so we thought and once they were really dried out they were they were clear enough and able to manage on their own and one of them we did a step down process and lived in an apartment nearby but came and got medications and did that for a few months and then really he was able to go live on his own independently again and connected with AA and it all worked well. The thing to remember about alcohol dementia is that you really need to watch it for a long time to be sure that it isn't just uh, a detox delirium. So non-pharmacological approaches to substance abuse, um, you need to really help them look for personal interests and hobbies. These are folks that have really been using alcohol to meet all their needs. You know, it's been their crutch, it's been their social outlet, and for them to put their life back together is challenging. Usually, again, they've been drinking a long time. They are estranged from their family members um, who are, uh, you know, who have gone through a lot of challenges in having an alcoholic parent, and they don't have a lot of social networks. So moving into a care community usually means the care community is doing a lot to create a home and, and find things that they can be engaged in. Now, depending how far advanced their their drinking was, they usually maintain some verbal skills. They are amazingly charming folks as a rule, and I always think it must be that's how they got to drink so long because they could go into a bar and they probably haven't been gain, uh, gainfully employed for very long, but they're charming and you can get people to buy them drinks, and so that charm comes out. Usually other mental health problems come out once they're dry, like depression or anxiety. Social engagement is great and trying to keep them engaged. Sometimes they're loners and really want to disengage, but um, as much as possible having them be involved in activities with others. Exercise, helpful. iPods, sometimes, um, uh, again, uh, more that they want their music, but they want it in their room by themselves um, on their own stereo system or their own speaker system. And uh, lastly, like I said, you need to treat those comorbid mental health problems, the depression, anxiety, or whatever. The nice thing about this uh, disease is that it doesn't, uh, doesn't tend to progress, but normal aging um, problems show up, and there's a lot of uh, other medical issues that may be appearing over time, but usually the care plan for their dementia really stays fairly stagnant for years. Next type of neurocognitive disorder is uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia. This type of dementia I think of as persons that are really disinhibited, uh, compulsive. Um, the, the thing that shows up early in the disease before it's diagnosed is this loss of empathy. Uh, you know, there's, there's three variants to this type of dementia, but just uh, as a general class, um, the loss of empathy is things like Thanksgiving dinner, the mom will say something horrible about the daughter-in-law and she's fat and lazy and why did you ever marry her? and the son will say, Mom, why are you speaking like that? And she'll say, well, it's true. And she'll have no remorse or uh, empathize in any way that what she said is inappropriate or, and hurtful. So disinhibited in the cultural norms as well as the loss of empathy. And this affects caregivers a lot. Um, a person with Alzheimer's that is aggressive in a shower and pushing and yelling and whatever, uh, at the end of a shower, they will nine times out of 10 say, I'm sorry, or thank you for the shower, even really advanced. These folks will never say thank you. They will never have any remorse. And care 
um, partners are very challenged by that. It's hard to take care of someone that's so negative and so um, that lacks so much empathy. They have difficulty changing tracks with their compulsive type behaviors or hoarding. You'll hear that they've been hoarding for the last five or six years before uh, diagnosis. They will uh, have whatever uh, thought or behavior is very, very repetitive. Again, unlike Alzheimer's where they say they want to go home, they want to go home, you can redirect easily and um, distract them and move them into a better space. These folks, when they get on a track of, we had one uh, patient here for many years who had a dog named Henry, and she had to have Henry, she had to find Henry, whereas Henry and Henry would be in her lap, or Henry, Henry would be with her in her bed, but she had uh, such profound perseveration for Henry, it was constant, constant, unless she was asleep or out walking, um, which is hard to, to do. Medications, again, I'll let others talk about that. Uh, Non-pharmacological approaches, Henry, like we said, another gal that would just clap and need lots of noise. We would literally take outside and walk during all meal times. Family and staff need a lot of support. They need to not work with these residents for long periods of time. They need to change um, which unit or neighborhood or whatever they work in over time because they will drain you. And you, you just have to find ways to meet that obsessive, um, perseverating behavior that isn't disturbing to everybody else either in the care community or the family. And that can be challenging and requires a lot of creativity. Okay, tool number two, I'm going to move along a little faster. I think I'm uh, getting behind. Uh, you need to know the person. You need to know, like, just beyond the basic things that a lot of social histories um, talk about. You need to know where they're born. I like to know if they have siblings. It's helpful to know where they grew up in the country, in the city, where they ranked in their family. Really try and talk to family members. Children aren't so great at it. They want to talk about when mom and dad were raising them. And what's more helpful is to go back further. Where did mom and dad grow up? What was their life then? Because more and more as the diseases progress, they will revert back to their long-term memory, especially with Alzheimer's. I know what their employment was, see if that can become part of what they do in, the, uh, in their house or in their care community. Hobbies, preferences, marital status, children, and their spiritual uh, needs. One thing that we do is try to have a quick and uh, fast for other residents, family members, staff, to to know something about each person with a neurocognitive disorder that's meaningful to them so that they can have an opening dialogue. And it's amazing. Even with Alzheimer's, they read until late in the disease. So they will read name tags until late in the disease. And when we put name tags on people during family events and social activities, uh, it helps them go up and say, oh, Tom, you are a doctor? Holy cow. And what did you farm? Or Jenny? Game shows are, you know, Price is Right. Just something to start a conversation to help them with that social engagement is very helpful. And again, when you're talking and listening and recognizing somebody, that, that puts them in a good space and allows them to not feel so frustrated and lonely and then the behaviors associated with that of uh, becoming fearful and agitated and aggressive. Know their music. Have pets. Have as many pets as you can because even if they don't like to pet them, uh, they like to talk about them and look at them and think about them and visit them. And we have uh, zillions of birds, dogs, and chickens, and I don't know what all. Tool three, um, you need to just be sure to rule out delirium. I think that in the next uh, webinar, this is going to be more. Um, uh, discuss, but just a uh, mnemonic that I use is called confusion. Just helps me remember when I get those faxes from care communities about what's going on. He's beating everybody up. He's hitting, kicking. 
have we really gone through and looked at all the normal reasons why, why persons with dementia get agitated and aggressive. Number one is always constipation. Always, if they have food, they're going to hit you. Just oxygenation, is their CHF unstable, their heart disease, uh, is, is they getting a respiratory infection? Are they hungry? Are they hangry? Are they getting enough snacks? For an Alzheimer patient, they are so busy walking, they need two to three times the normal amount of food. So they need like 6,000, 4 to 6,000 calories a day when they are walking. You notice they're usually quite thin versus the vascular dementia, which are overweight. So be aware of the nutritional needs. Tell families that they have to carry lots of snacks with them. Fluids, um, trying to get older folks to drink is uh, quite a challenge during hot months and when heat is on in the home in care homes in the winter they can get dehydrated easily any you know neurovirus or whatever with vomiting and diarrhea you really got to think of hydration and it, you know telling the care center you need to push fluids is not really that helpful because they just won't take them one thing that we've tried to do is have um, little serving trays with very small glasses of juice or water or uh, coffee or whatever, small amounts, like 100 cc's, and taking that around every hour and offering it and saying, just, you know, drink a little bit frequently rather than putting uh, big fluids in front of them. Helps somewhat, but folks uh, refuse to uh, drink as the disease progresses. They don't feel thirsty. Urinary retention, uh, prostates get big and urinary retention happens. They're not going to tell you I'm not peeing well. They're not going to relate that. You're not going to, they're not going to have a fever, so you're not going to think of retention from a UTI. They're just going to get cranky and aggressive and you need to ask the care staff always and spouses always to watch the flow of urine. If it's diminished, you need to let someone know. Sleep deprivation, huge. Um, I'm using a lot of Small dose melatonin, half milligram at 5 p.m. and then three around 10 p.m. to reset their brain. If they're in a care community, they're not getting outside and getting sun, which uh, helps with a um, normal sleep routine. So uh, being aware of that and trying, uh, trying to also create the ritual of sleep. And you know, it's bedtime, getting days, maybe having a little snack, taking them into bed and rubbing their back and telling them how wonderful they are and how great and go to sleep and maybe have music on or read them a story, literally ritualize sleep and they seem to do better and are able to calm down. Even if they wake up in the middle of the night, start it all over again or wake up five times in the night and start that same ritual all over again. Always infections, the biggies are respiratory, urinary, and skin. Opioids and a lot of um, buzz in the um, media about opioids. Uh, we have, you know, seniors with advanced arthritis and hip fractures and um, other diseases that cause a lot of pain, and they don't do well on NSAIDs and they don't do uh, you can do Tylenol only so much. And sometimes you have to go to opioids, but you got to remember that they can cause delirium and um, increase confusion. New and old medications, just remember that, uh, you know, medications they've been on forever, their beta blocker or their calcium channel blocker, I don't care what it is, uh, they can suddenly become delirious with those. Um, and of course, new medications, even a new antibiotic can cause acute delirium. Lastly, talk about triggers. You know, what is it that sets people off? What happens and what can we do to prevent it? Are they territorial? Well, do they need a lock on their door? Do they need to eat at the bar and not at the table? Do they need more space than others? And they shouldn't be invited to the big social events because they don't like it and they, they don't feel safe there. Well, that's okay. Noise levels, some people, if, if it's too quiet, they don't like it. They want the TV blaring all the time and other, other folks really don't like noise. So you have to think about separating those personalities are they bored? Boredom, I think, actually is one of the biggest reasons for um, persons with different types of memory loss to um, become aggressive. It just reminds me of kids on a rainy day on a Saturday, been indoors all day, and they, they're bored and they, they get cranky. So keeping things interesting and uh, active is very important. Uh, 
patronizing conversation. I don't care how impaired they are, they know if they're being talked down to and they don't like it. Um, are they too hot? Are they too cold? And this really, um, you just need to pay attention to because it can make them quite irritable. Always personal care. Imagine somebody coming and saying, I'm going to take off you and put you in the shower. All of you listening out there, that I'm sure you'd just be thrilled and put your arms up and say, yes, come do that to me. Uh, the rest of us would say, well, I'm not really up for it. Um, be sensitive and remember that taking a shower is a very personal activity and that it's amazing that care staff are able to give showers as well as they are. Um, there's ponchos that you can wear to keep them covered. You can make sure the bathroom's really warm. You can have a familiar person do it. Maybe it has to be a male caregiver, maybe female. You need to figure that out, but just uh, be sensitive to that. Sometimes just you are the problem. Your voice tone, you look like that sister-in-law that they didn't like. You look like um, somebody that's angry or your attitude isn't good and you're presenting somebody that's rushed and irritable or you had a fight with your significant other before coming to work and your energy isn't good. And so just be aware that you might be the problem or that the care staff that you're getting that fax from might be the problem. And uh, I'll open it up for questions now. And this is Pearl who comes to work with me every day and is part of the um, non-pharmacological therapeutic interventions. Thank you.